This is Signet, a beautiful town in the Huon Valley, around an hour from Hobart. I'm visiting some friends who a few years back made the big move to Tassie to set up their own place. I had a hand in the design of the garden, but Nick and Kirsten had a very clear idea of what they wanted and have made it completely and productively their own. I love the relationship between me and the plants and the soil and understanding that I can have a meaningful relationship with the other parts of my ecosystem. It makes me feel happy to be alive. Nick and Kirsten have already appeared on Gardening Australia back when they lived and worked on Meliodora, the Victorian property owned by David Holmgren, one of the co-originators of permaculture. So what is permaculture? Permaculture is a way of reconnecting with place, connecting with where your food comes from, where your water comes from, where your waste products go, um, really connecting fundamentally with the ecosystem around you. These fundamental permaculture principles are reflected in the layout of the garden. Because it's north facing, we have this section is the biggest microclimate, it's the sun catcher, we've got citrus against that wall. We've got perennials catching the sun with all these rockeries, then it's down into intensive annual garden and then berry arbor and then below that is the perennial fruit trees and more perennial gardens and a pond and chicken house. It looks quite organic and flowing, but it's actually quite structured. Yeah, I think that the, the slope lends itself to that. We, we try to create these sort of flat areas and that means that you end up dividing the space up. Because it is a backyard, not a farm, and having come from farming, to us the veggie garden being two steps down makes all the sense in the world. So you've got sort of outdoor living first, then intensive veggies, then fruit trees. It's hard to miss the number of large rocks that have been used in the garden design. They provide all this strength, they provide all this thermal mass, which is so important in this kind of climate. They're absolutely just gorgeous objects. That was a little bit of a, a challenge to find a material that was both local and abundant. And this rock came from just down the road and it allows us to really step the landscape down and provide all this amazing habitat and thermal mass. It's a good point, isn't it? Because it's not just about plants, it's about all those little critters that live in those nooks and crannies and just loving life because yeah, they're there. Yeah, there's so many in insects that are burrowing in there now and so many lizards. lizards yeah. And, you know, a few rats at one point, but I think we've seen them off. Well, that's what <laughs> this little guy's for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to, keep, to keep those at bay. I reckon no garden is complete without a veggie patch, and this is a beauty. I'm pretty proud of it, actually. It's, we've got like seven of these main beds here, and each one, I'm, I'm a bit of a stickler for maths and things, so exactly five square metres in each bed. They're all nice and regular, so we can swap the irrigation over or bits of shade cloth or little hoop houses to protect things from bugs and light. Yeah. That's great. And I love that you've got carrots, but you've got something else in here as well. Yes, we've got leeks in between, and then we've got a quick crop of mizuna there that. in the middle. And then this is just salads, just to keep us going in the meantime till everything else gets up, and a half bed of green manure to regenerate that bed for next season. In between the beds, all our paths are really deep combination of wood chip and local sawdust, because it gets a bit squelchy here after a bit of rain like we've had, and it's nice to have it not too muddy. This bed, we've got our brassicas down each side, but in the meantime, we planted this really quick crop of snow peas to like just pop up and get a few snow peas off but they'll stop flowering really soon once the temperature drops and at that point we'll cut and pull out the snow peas and give a lot more light and space to the brassicas. Do a bunch of this sort of temporary trellising and mm. move them around from bed to bed depending yeah. on what we're doing. And it's a real, this one in particular is a really striking example of stacking your plants in yeah. very close proximity. Yeah, in space and in time. That's and right, we'll Love get it. six months out of the bed. And part of the crop rotation is giving things a rest as well. So like in this bed we've got just a green manure, a few marigolds sort of surviving, but this will uh, rejuvenate it so it's ready for planting. We made this compost about three months ago, so it's resting now. We really like making our own compost here. 
So Nick, there's so many different types of composting. What type is this one? Yeah, so this is a, a hot compost, a thermophilic compost. So that involved us making a big pile, like a big, more than a cubic metre pile, with a lot of manure and, and veggie scraps, and it got really hot, but that means it needs turning. So you get a workout, and it's good to have a good sort of compost fork like this. So that took a couple of months of us turning it kind of once a week or so to keep it from getting too hot and killing everything. But now it's settled right down, it's dropped back down to, you know, right now it's like 20 degrees, mm. which is about the average temperature here. Mm. Sometimes people think it's the sun that's heating up the compost, but it's actually all that biology, isn't it? Yeah, it's just like us when we work hard, uh, mm. we, we, we get hot and <laughs> those critters are working hard, all that bacteria is working hard to break down the yummy goodness in the scraps and mm. that generates a lot of heat, yeah. So this is our berry arbor. It's got a whole lot of different varieties of berries all the way along and then it's got summer raspberries on that side and autumn raspberries on that side in between these trailing bramble berries. Yeah. And you've also got a pretty strong understory plants as well. What's happening there? Yeah, so we've got this bed is quite wet so we have a whole lot of different varieties of mint on that side and just beautiful flowers to be beautiful and wonderful on this side. Very important job. <laughs> it is a very important job yeah. being beautiful. I'm loving the way your young edible forest garden is coming along with so many different layers. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Like we've got this understory of flowering plants down low and ground covers and then sort of a mid-story and then the overstory of the fruit trees. It's all nice and stable, doesn't require too much work. And we've made sure that all the trees here are on dwarf rootstock so that, yeah, we can keep the tree sizes compact, which makes it a lot easier to harvest and a lot easier to net them for bird pressure as well. So, mm. And lets a little bit more light through and air through for the understory. Down here in this climate, it's important because it's, you know, it's a bit wetter and a bit cooler. Yeah. And the edible forest garden is also sometimes called a food forest and obviously we, it provides food for us but does other functions as well, yeah? Yeah, everyone that lives in this garden is having a great time in terms of all the insects and the pollinators and the lizards and the worms and then all the soil food web, everything that's happening underneath the surface. We're trying to feed everyone that lives in this garden. So welcome to our chicken palace. <laughs> Pretty specky. Yeah, yeah, it's all made out of recycled, found bits and pieces. Harvests the rainwater off the roof? Yeah, yeah, rainwater comes off the roof, into that gutter, into this chicken water barrel, and then there's like chicken nipple water pecky things, which, yeah, they really like using, keeps all the water really clean, and we never have to wonder if they've got enough water. Yeah, it's good. sorted. And the roof keeps this area nice and dry underneath for where their feed is, and it's got this um, clear bit so that lots of light can come in and to wake them up early in the morning in the winter. It's a very gourmet and, chicken house. <laughs> and the slatted floor means that all the manure just falls through and it goes down onto this bit of slope in recycled plastic here. And then just when we hit the plastic, all the manure falls down into this gutter and we can scrape it out into the bucket. It's nice and simple. And looks really fun. It's amazing how much Nick and Kirsten have achieved in just a couple of years. But really, they're just beginning their latest garden adventure with lots more still to do. So there's a whole lot of tiny little ones Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well. You're allowed to take them out. That's yeah. all right. Do you enjoy gardening together? <laughs> I think we enjoy creating gardens together. I think we quite often need to sort of split up the tasks. We've learnt ways to delegate uh, to each other and, and find our own niche, I think, in each thing we do. It's very um, collaborative, though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs>